Let's all pray together. Our Heavenly Father who loves us, who is a holy and merciful God. We thank you for saving us with your precious blood and forgiving us of all our sins without any price that we needed to pay on our behalf. We thank you for all the grace that you have given us to live the rest of our lives in true hope. At this time, Father, we pray as our brothers and sisters who have been saved have gathered here together before your presence to study your word, to have fellowship with one another. We pray that at this time you may be with us and we believe that you are with us. And we further pray that you may continuously look after each and every single one of our brothers and sisters, that you may uphold them with your strength and power, and that you may renew every one of us to be your children, that you may uphold us to be whole and complete before you, so that when we stand before your presence, when you are soon going to appear before us, that we would stand before you without shame. Please allow for health to our brothers and sisters who are sick or feeling ill. We pray for those who are being tempted or tested in their heart, who are going through difficulties in their lives, that you may provide them with appropriate, appropriate grace. And um, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are preaching the gospel, who are keeping their faith far away in different countries, who are who are doing your work in your ministry, we pray for their faith and that you may uphold them and keep them steadfast. We pray for our brothers and sisters who cannot be here with us today, that they are listening attentively online in their homes because of this current situation. We pray also that you may be with them with the same grace that you provide us today. We ask that you may reveal to us the words that you want to teach us. And that you would teach us how we ought to conduct ourselves before you. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll have the choir um, sing for us.
Find a scripture for our initial passage today. We'll take a look at Gospel of Matthew chapter five. The Gospel of Matthew chapter five. We'll look at verse five and six. Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'll just read up to there. And uh, today's Sunday. And... Many more people, brothers and sisters, have gathered here on this Lord's Day more than we've had so far in the past due to this current pandemic. And I have no doubt in my mind that very soon all of our brothers and sisters will be able to happily gather together. And I hope that that time will come quicker rather than later. And I know that for a fact that our brothers and sisters will be able to have free fellowship and that God will grant that opportunity to us. Today we're going to study about the passage that uh, we just read, um, exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us, and um, especially what he has said on the Sermon on the Mount, right, we just read. Um, you know, in these Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew 5, we learn about who are blessed. And um, according to the standards of the world, the blessings of the world is different than the blessings that the Lord truly desires to give us. You know, man, there are things that man desires, but that's not something that God necessarily may want to give to you because what God desires to give to us are eternal things, eternally, eternal blessings. It's completely different than what man would desire. And we are further deeply studying about what these blessings are and what we ought to do to receive these blessings. And it is our responsibility and duty to study these matters. You know, the first thing is, blessed are the poor in spirit, we've learned. We learned about those who mourn, that how they are blessed. You know, last week we learned that um, we come into this world without anything, with empty hands. And we also leave empty-handed. And that we can take nothing back for what we've labored for. You know, our lives are very vain in that sense. And likewise, nothing in this world can truly fill our hearts and give us true content or satisfaction. And more than anything, we have to desire the will of God and the, the heart of God. And those who desire God are the people who are truly weak. I'm sorry, to, who are truly poor at heart. And to the people who are poor at heart is the ones that will receive the kingdom of God to enter into the kingdom of God. And, and today, we, we want to further stretch and learn about 
who else is who else will be blessed? Um, in the earlier passages of the Beatitudes, there's those who mourn, and the scripture says that blessed are those who mourn, those who repent of their sins. Because of our sins, we were so far away from God. We were enemies of God, and we deserve nothing more than judgment and to be condemned by God eternally. And those people are the ones who mourn, who repent because of their sins. And these are the ones that will be blessed according to the scriptures. These are the ones that will be forgiven of their sins according to the scriptures. And we also what studied about those who are meek. You know, we've learned that as born again Christians, after we have been saved, the Holy Spirit enters our heart. And as the Holy Spirit entering our heart, the sinful nature of ourselves, um, on on the contrary to the sinful nature that we had, we have the 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 character of Christ embedded into us. Jesus said, "Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." That's the meek heart. That's the lowly and the gentle heart. And this is not what's a part of human nature because it's human nature is sinful but rather it's it's a it's a quality and the character of Christ that is given to born again Christians and is not found in the heart of people who are not saved but as a born again Christian the holy spirit um, gives us this opportunity to through the holy spirit to possess this heart of Christ to be meek to be um gentle and to be kind and to be gentle, it means that no matter what circumstance or hardships one may face, that person possesses an obedient heart. It is someone in the scriptures that is able to possess the heart of Christ. As, you know, Jesus Christ is described as a lamb to the slaughter and the sheep for the shearer, but was silent. He did not open his mouth. Jesus, when he was condemned to be crucified on the cross, when he was chastised and whipped and was put into shame and eventually he was crucified on the tree he did not say a single word he did not criticize or complain to those people that are crucifying him or even to God and the reason for that is because Jesus understood all of that was under the will of God therefore he did not open his mouth he was crucified, he died on the cross, and he shed his precious blood, and until the very moment that last drop of blood was shed, he stayed silent, and that's the reason why we are saved. That's the reason why we are born again. The heart of Christ is our heart. As a born-again Christian, we also must pursue Jesus Christ, his example. Whatever hardships, whatever sufferings we may face, we must be able to peacefully without complaining follow God we have to follow God by carrying our own cross we have to follow the Lord as who he is that is the image of gentleness that is the heart of a person who possesses a kind or gentle lowly and a meek heart as Jesus has demonstrated what we want to discuss about today what we would like to learn about today is especially regarding verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who are these people? These are the people that after they have been saved, they possess this lowly and gentle heart. These are the people who have the qualities now to also hunger and thirst for righteousness. Born and Christians have a heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And what this passage really means and for us to really initially think about is what we want to study about today throughout this Sunday sermon. In this world, being full, um, being able to live and enjoy your life in luxury, eat and drink whatever you like is the person who is blessed. But according to the Lord, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean he's talking about people who are physically hungry and thirsty, but people who are physically, I'm sorry, spiritually hungry and thirsty for righteousness. 
as born again Christians, we have the ability to seek God's righteousness. We have a desire, we hunger, and we yearn for the righteousness of God. That is what it means to be blessed as those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When people who are hungry, those who are hungry are able to seek food, and those who are thirsty desire to drink. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you didn't have any food to eat. You were so hungry. Have you had that experience? I'm not talking about you're hungering. You're hungry because you're going on a diet. But we we're talking about not really not being able to eat literally because we don't have food. I have. I've experienced that. Have you ever experienced being so thirsty because you did not have water? I'm sure you don't. Right? Because for the most part, when you're thirsty, you have tr water to drink. You have something to quench your thirst. When I was younger, I remember I went um, hiking with this older man. And this older man, his job was, um, you know, he was a handyman. He used to fix things around from this town to that town. And I thought it was pretty amazing. So I followed him on his trip. And we were hiking. And we lost, uh, you know, we were in the middle of the hike. And I was so thirsty and our destination our next village our next town was miles and miles away so all i thought about during the whole hike before we got to the village was my me wanting to drink water if you're thirsty you we seek water those who are hungry those who are thirsty they look and they yearn food they yearn water to drink and likewise as christians in our hearts we yearn we desire for god's righteousness and that is how Jesus, that, and that is what Jesus is alluding to when he says, Blessed are they. The people of the world, they have desires for their flesh, and they have desires, you know, for their physical longings. And that could either come in money. You know, some people, whether they're asleep or awake, all they think about money, how they can make more money, how they could be more wealthy how they can live a more luxury life they have a thirst for um, for money some people have thirst for pride for honor you know they desire honor and the praise of other people and to be complimented by other people and they study they would think about whether they are sleeping or they are awake. That's all they think about. Some people have desires for pleasure or power. How they can trample on top of other people and really launch themselves on a pedestal. Some people desire and long after power. Some other people are yearning for culture. For entertainment. For things that they can enjoy. People who like to enjoy themselves, to who fall into singing, art, things that are away opposite from God. They they dedicate their lives to these things. There are some people that do that, and some other folks. They have hobbies, things that they enjoy. You know, when I first got saved, I preached all over the country in Korea. And I remember this young um, student, a theologian student, theological student. He wanted to follow me because he wanted to help with my preaching. And this young man, he used to go to, he went to the seminary and he was a student at the seminary. And he followed me around and he told me, you know, I like to collect old artifacts. I have a hobby. And I asked him, what is your hobby? He said, I like to collect old artifacts. I, he said that he has if he has a little bit of money he buys old artifacts and I said what do you do he says I touch these old artifacts and I think about how the people of the past handled themselves and I thought what this this guy is this this man is out of his mind you buy ancient artifacts and you think that you feel how people's way of life was in the past what what good does that do that's that's a useless hobby i remember i rebuked him for that but there's just different kinds of people 
there's some people who collect postcards, you know, post notes from all over the world. They spend all their money to gather these things. Great, that's your hobby, but what good does that do? A lot of people, because they don't have true satisfaction and contentment, they waste away their money, their time into useless things. Some people, of course, are so thirsty for lust, for the opposite sex. Um, you know, they think about a handsome or a pretty woman or a handsome man. That's all they care about. They have no satisfaction. They like this guy, that guy, this girl, that girl. That's like the Samaritan woman. I don't know if you recall that story. She had five husbands and she's living with the sixth man. And Jesus said, no, you have no husband. That's right. She was thirsty. And, you know, as if you drink this water that she was by, she kept on drinking and you thirsted again. But Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will never thirst. But whoever drinks the water that I shall, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. And what Jesus was talking about, he's not talking about physical things and things that waste time away. Because he's saying that the woman and people of the world are swimming around thinking after the things of the world. That's going to make them thirst again. Right? But Jesus has the ability to, to give us anything and everything. Animals, they're sufficient with the food and the shelter that they have. You know, they feel good about themselves when they're full. You know? You know, some people say even humans can actually have that quality too. They say, well, if they've eaten so well, they say... I don't, I'm not, I don't envy the president. I feel like the wealthiest man because I've filled my stomach. But again, all that goes to say is that soon you will thirst and hunger again with the things of the world. We have a spirit and likewise, because of the spirit, we cannot be fully satisfied by the things of the world. Because we have a spirit, we have a heart to desire God, eternal things. You know, because of sins, man is lost so far away from God. And that's why, even though, <clears throat> uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Because what may be known of God is manifested to them, them, for God has shown it to them. Even though man, because man is created in the image of God, they seek after eternal things. They look for God, or they look for other things that will... Take the place of God. That's what religion is, basically. They try to grasp on through things, but it's not going to happen. Religion is that. It's people seeking after what will fill their hearts and satisfy their hearts. But according to Psalms chapter 14, verse 2, there looks down, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Not a single person seeks God because of their sins. They have no wisdom. They have no way to seek God. And that's why they're looking for happiness and satisfaction in other things. Romans chapter 2 verse um, 15 tells us, Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing them. The conscience is the works of the, the Holy Spirit. And because if they're not saved and they do not have true contentment, they desire in their hearts for there not to be a God. Why? Because if there is a God, God is holy, He's perfect, He's someone that hates and detests sin, and therefore because of their sins they're going to be judged by God. That's why they desire for there to be no God. That's their longing. And they say to themselves, there is no God. They claim that there is no God. They live in this fantasy of their own world, desiring and this wishful thinking that there is no God, and they indulge themselves in sin. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 tells us, he, who is God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also has put eternity into their hearts that no one can find out the work of God that He does from the beginning to the end. God has given eternity into our hearts. We have to fear someone who is able to not only um, kill our flesh, but also kill our spirit, meaning throw our spirits to hell. We have eternity in their hearts. We have a desire for eternity in our hearts. And that is why we as man... We have to be forgiven of our sins and be given into the bosom of our Lord with the hope and the true assurance that we will enter the kingdom of God eternally. And without that, we will never have true satisfaction. We will never have true contentment. But people of the world, 
they they fool themselves. They try to look for happiness somewhere else that it's not present. That's why Proverbs chapter 14 verse 13, even in laughter the heart may sorrow and the end of mirth may be grief. You know, there's an old saying saying that even though you laugh, your laugh is a fake laugh. And people laugh, but then they look like and they feel like they're enjoying things, but in their hearts, no, that is really not the case. Their hearts really in their themselves, they're suffering. In themselves, there is no true contentment. There is a suffering that they really do face and feel from their spirits, and they try to fill it. They try to cover it, and they try to forget it by indulging themselves in physical things. By eating and drinking, singing, shouting, and they they do not listen to the groaning of their hearts because of the distractions they have from the noise of the world. That is why in people, men, we have a desire. A, a concern of eternity. And until the very moment that that issue, that problem is resolved, that person will never feel happiness. That person will never feel true joy. It's so unfortunate though that people that do not, they don't understand that. They make money and they're not satisfied. Wealthy people, when they die, they say, what did I do wrong? Is being rich bad? They say that. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But they tell themselves that we have enough for the rest of our lives. But if you ever looked at a child who's lost his mother, he's lost his mother and he's just losing his mind. He lost everything. You can give the child a candy, a good toy. You can give him good clothing. That's not going to satisfy the child. The child, is, the child is still going to cry for his mom. Maybe for a little while he can get distracted. But very soon he will feel that his mom is still not around. Until the very moment the child re reconnects with mom, her, the child's fear is not going to go away. And that is why the people of the world, they try to cover themselves or they try to... Uh, fill themselves with other things other than God. People, they can make money all they want and they will still never be satisfied. They can have power or some level of power and they can try to strive to gain more power as some people really do. But I feel very bad for them. I, I, I pity them. There's people in the past where they try to have power and yet most of them became more pitiable actually they lived their lives in misery more than happiness it might have been better for them to not even grab that power in the first place not to have power in the first place people could have fame honor but it's only for a limited time it's temporary even if you receive all the complaints I'm sorry compliments from the people of the world it means really nothing when I was young, I felt, you know, when I was younger, it's kind of amazing how I used to think like this when I was younger. I used to think that when I die, I thought if I did something great and I died, my tomb will be remembered me to really have my legacy and... I want my name to be engraved in diamonds. But I thought, why does what does that have to do with me anyway? Meaning like even if I did great things and people have my legacy and remember me and my name is engraved in diamonds, that'd be great, but if I die it really would mean nothing. You know, I thought about this ever since probably you know, sixth grade in middle school. I started going to church from that time and for 10 plus years I lived a so-called Christian life but I was missing something I thought you know I believe in Jesus Christ and that's why I'm gonna go to heaven but I never really felt I never really felt tr 
true assurance. You know, I would sing songs and hymns and make a noise, and I would say and cry out and pray, but my heart still felt so vain. My heart still felt so quiet and empty. And I thought, how can I make more money? When I go through a house that I really liked, I would think, when am I going to live in a house like that? When I go through and see people drive nice cars, I would think, when will I be able to drive those nice cars? And there's so many things that I envied. And I really wanted to live my life, you know, so that people would actually envy me. I studied hard without sleeping and it, you know, it never worked out. Meaning, like, I'd never satisfy my heart. But the very day that I got saved, I, I, I remember coming to terms and understanding. And my heart still hasn't changed even to this very day that nobody could envy me. My sins have been forgiven eternally. I've been born again. I, God is my Father. What more do I want? You know, all the day long that I live my life, God is going to always be with me. If I depart from this world, I will enter the kingdom of God. What more do I want than that? There's no more sufferings, no more hardships. And I will be with God forever, eternally. You know? And I believe in the promise of the Bible like that. So, there's nothing for me to worry about. And from that point on, no matter how rich or wealthy someone was, I do not envy them at all. Not at all. I wonder to themselves, as a matter of fact, I feel bad for them. Do those people have as much happiness as I have? You know, that's why as I live this life, I, I see and pity these people because they want to fill themselves with the luxuries of this world, with the things of the world. But none of those things will ever quench the thirst of their spirit it just can't it won't they have to feel their spiritual thirst and hunger and yet they feel it but they don't see what can satisfy it and God told this wealthy man he said fool this night your soul will be required of you then whose will those things be which you have provided you can have all the money you want you can have all the wisdom you want but is that really yours? Because in a certain amount of time, in a, in, in a blink of an eye, all these things will be perishing. All these things will be taken away. That is why people, they look after, they long for the things of the world, the foolish things of the world. And they go after these things and they swim around. And they long for these things, but they can't find it. But we as Christians, we are people who do not hunger. We Christians are people who are eating the bread of life, who are drinking out of the bread of life. John chapter 6 verse 35 tells, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John chapter 4 verse 13 to 14 Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. That I shall give him and will become him in a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the water from Christ. That if you were to drink it once, you will never thirst again. It is the fountain of life. It is the water that provides an eternal fountain of life. People of the world who don't believe that, they'll, they can't even imagine what that is like. They'll never understand. He won't understand. They will think, where is this water? What, what is this source? They'll never get it. But we're not talking about this, this physical satisfaction. But we're talking about spiritual satisfaction. That whether we live or die, we still live in peace. Even if people talk negatively about us, we still live in peace. Because it's such a great peace and happiness that overjoys us. Even if we're poor, even if we're sick and ill, nothing can take that away. And there's nothing that will take us away 
from this. But it, this is the real issue is that if you have do not have this matter resolved, you have to resolve this first. You have to find this water from Christ. That is the first thing you have to do. John chapter 6 verse 51 I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh. You will never die if you eat from this. This is eternal life. And this is precisely what is Christian, we as Christians desire. This is what we as Christians have, as born again Christians have. But because we drank from the, the eternal water of our Lord. And we as born again Christians can furthermore have something that people of the world do not have. That would be completely different. First of all, we as born again Christians desire the word of God. We desire God's word. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? And living by the word of God. We are not talking about physical um, food. You know, people who spiritually dead who are not saved, God's word is not their is not their food. If you went to a dead corpse and you fed it food and you put placed water or food into their mouth, can that help them? That's the same way. People who are not saved, who are not really born again, they can study the scriptures and the Bible all they want. But really, they don't have the they don't have the ability to digest and utilize the food, the word of God, to help them. It can help them in knowledge, in morality, and and maybe in history that they can understand certain things. However, we cannot guarantee, and we know that for a fact that that person, that word of God, will never give them true satisfaction as it does to born again Christians. Job twenty three twelve. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than necessary food. You know, we need God's word more importantly than anything. Anything that you eat at a certain time. God's word is our living source. As a born-again Christian, even from my own experiences, my, my personal goal was I, can, I don't have to do anything right, but I want to read the Bible as much as I can. You know, I went to seminary before I went to, before I was saved. I read the New Testament about 50 times, the Old Testament 30 times. Yes, I read them a lot, even as a person who was not saved. You know, I used to have this pattern where I would eat I would read a chapter in the Bible before I would feed myself for breakfast. It was my habit. I remember doing these things. Right? I, I, I did take the Word of God more importantly than the necessary food. The nation of Israel, when they exited out of Egypt and went into the wilderness, what God provided them as food and the source of food was God gave them manna. God fed the nation of Israel with manna. And the Israelites, on a daily basis, they ate manna. And likewise, we must eat, consume the Word of God every day, on a daily basis. We have to seek after God's Word. You know, Jesus Christ, after He was baptized in the Jordan River, He was led by the Holy Spirit and went into the wilderness. And for 40 days, He was hungry, he fasted. And in the midst of those four days, the devil came to Jesus and tempted him. And said, if you are truly the Son of God, then eat. What's wrong with you if you are the child of God? Why are you on the verge of death? Make this food, transform the stones into food. Jesus Christ, he said he could use these stones and make them the descendants of Abraham. There's nothing that he could do, he could not do. He has the power. But the, tempt, the temptation from the devil is that you're great and you're an almighty God and yet why do you struggle with this? Of not being able to eat. And this is how Jesus responded. He said, For it is written, and he quoted off Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. For man shall live not by bread alone. Not For man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not only should you read and listen to the Word of God, 
You have to live a life, a lifestyle of obeying the Word of God. That is what it means for that food, the Word of God to be food. You know, when we read Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, we often quote that verse by saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we say that and we quote that. As the people of the world eat physical foods, we also eat physical foods, but we live really based off of our spiritual foods, which is the Word of God. We know that, that the Word of God is more important than anything else. We read, we study, we listen, right? Isn't that correct? But what the Lord really means at this point in time is not that. What Jesus meant. You know, He's not saying when you're hungry, you read the Bible and it becomes your food. That's not what He means. He means that a living, a, a life of obedient, obedience, a life of obeying the Word of God is food. Is the form of life. You can listen to God's Word. And learn all you want, but if you do not apply it, that person is not really eating the food of the, eating the word of God. That we must not become the people that listens to God's word and forget it. We're to deceive ourselves. If you do not do, if you do not do what you've heard, you deceive yourself. If you've read, listened, and understood God's word, then you must apply it. Apply the word of God to your life. And by applying the Word of God to your life, you live a life of obedience every day. That must become our food. That is our food. That is why in Jeremiah chapter 1, 15, 16, Jeremiah confesses to God, Your words were found and I ate them, and your word was to me joy and a rejoicing of my heart. That's what Jeremiah said. I ate your food. I ate your word. And your food, your word became the joy of my heart. The rejoicing of my heart. So if that's the case, then are you only happy by knowing? No, you are happy because you live a life of obedience always. Why do people keep studying the word of God? Why must we study the word of God? We, we must constantly understand the love and the grace of God. But on top of that, we must live a life of obedience, understanding how holy the Lord is and what the holy will of God is. And according to Psalms chapter 119, verse 103, the word of God itself are sweet to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The word of God is so tasty that it's sweeter than honey. And Psalms 19 verse 10 tells us, More to be desired than are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. It's more sweeter than the honeycomb. It's more, it's something we must desire more than gold. When people listen to the word gold, their eyes open up, right? Their eyes perk up. Because they know the value of gold. Your word, the word of God, is, should be desired more than gold. And the word of God is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Have you ever tried the honeycomb? If you really go into the beehive and you... I've tried it. If you go into the beehive and you get the fresh organic honeycomb, it is so sweet. And, you know, Christians, even Christians that are not saved, they say, oh, I'm going to read the Word, I'm going to read the Bible, and they don't gain anything from it. Some people even read the Bible for the purpose of them going to sleep. For God says, or thus says the Lord, and they fall asleep, they snore. Because it's boring to them. Maybe you have that experience, I don't know. You know, when you're younger or for you know young men and women when they're dating they read each other their love letters and you know they like it they read it over and over again stay up all night because why they love reading their love letters from their loved one how is it that the, the word of God is not like that to us some people if you are on the verge of 
not listening to the word of God. You don't want to obey. You don't want to read. You've drawn far away from God because drawing far away from the word of God is itself drawing far away from God. You know, draw near to God and you will declare all his work. Drawing near to God means you're drawing near to the word of God. Right? Obeying the word of God is obeying God. Listening to the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God is drawing closer to God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Remember, we, we know that passage. And if you don't like the word of God... Knowing that the word of God is God. And I, I understand. Some of the passages in the Bible are very difficult to understand. I, I get that. And, you know, a young child can't eat everything that an adult eats. Because there's only certain things that he can eat as a young child. That's fine, though. As the child grows, he can he's able to eat or expand his, 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 his diet. And likewise, in our spiritual sense, it's the same. The word of God itself must give us and deliver us joy and happiness. And if that's not the case, then there's a problem. Something's wrong there. Is our spirit dead? Is our spirit sick? You know, people who are sick, they don't have an appetite. They just don't. Or you may have a different appetite for a different taste. Meaning you're snacking off into junk food. Not eating food that... Is actually beneficial to you. You know, when you look at kids, they don't want to eat sometimes. They just want to eat junk food. People whose taste buds are too keen to the things of the world, they don't want to listen to the Word of God. Some people love the news. Some people love watching dramas and they, they crack, they, they, they chuckle like that. And God's Word is not the same. The Word of God is tedious to them. Why? Their interest levels is somewhere else. You know, the things of the world only stimulate our physical emotions for a moment, but the Word of God itself is eternally beneficial to our souls. It gives us true joy and happiness. When you're caught up into the Word of God, the Word of God becomes your own satisfaction, and through it, nothing else can take its place from the world. So seeking and desiring the word of God is as a person who's hungry and thirsty seeks after food and water. We must seek God's word like that. When you look at Psalm chapter 42 verse 1, it says, As a deer pans for the water brooks, so my soul for you, O God, pants for you, O God. As the deer pants for the water brooks, my soul also pants for you. What that means is, it's not talking about someone longing for salvation. It's talking about fellowship after salvation, longing for fellowship with God, longing for fellowship through the Word of God after salvation. Is someone who really seeks after the word of God through fellowship is what this passage is describing. We have a heart that the people of the world don't have. We have a holy desire. And a born again Christian, of course, seeks after the righteousness of God. As Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They have a longing, a thirst, and a desire for righteousness. All people were born as sinners under Adam. And as a result, you know, they follow out their sinful nature. They commit sins. And live their lives as a sinner. You know, to a sinner, there's no heart for seeking righteousness. You know, can people who are not saved, can they seek righteousness? 
not the righteousness at least that God seeks for, their own righteousness, yes, but as Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, all we are like an unclean thing, our own righteousness are like filthy rags. Everything we do is filthy, it's not acceptable to God. It's like a wealthy or a filthy man trying to stand before a king. We cannot, our righteousness cannot compare or be called righteousness in the eyes of God. But Christians, we don't rely on our own righteousness. We have received the righteousness of our Lord. Romans chapter verse, chapter 3 verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For the grace of God, without a price, the Lord's righteousness became ours. For, for, without a price. We have been forgiven of our sins. At the same time our sins have been forgiven, we have been called holy. Romans chapter 5, you know, talks about how we were sinners under Adam. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Because the Lord obeyed, we all became righteous. We were sinners under Adam, but under the Lord we became righteous. God seeks after our faith, and with our faith He calls us to be righteous. Romans chapter verse six, Romans six eighteen. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are slaves of righteousness. We were slaves of sin before, but now. We're slaves of righteousness. Before we did what our sinful nature told us to do. If we're angry, we would curse. If we were envious, we would be greedy. If we were to despise people, we would hate. You know? We would follow after the things of the world because we were slaves of sin, doing bad things. We were doing what this sinful nature was telling us to do. The sin itself was our master. It took the place of a king in our heart. But, as Borean Christians, we have been set free from sin. And we became slaves of righteousness. Anyone who is a slave of sin will arrive to death. But those slaves of righteousness will arrive to eternal life. That is why we have been set free. And we have been set free, called to be righteous... And for the rest of our lives now, we have a desire to seek and live our lives according to that righteousness. We want that. First John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. If you look at the passage there, it tells us about do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of this world. The world is passing away, but the lust of it, and the lust of it. But... He who does the will of God abides forever. So, the people of the world, they have the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They desire for money, materials, sex, food. They want things that are comfortable. They want things that make them look good. But do not desire after eternal things. The things that pertain to God. You know, they ate the fruit. Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, they ate that. Even though it may have appeared delicious and they ate it. But they disobeyed God and they died. They were going to die. But the people of the world, they desire only that. The things of the world, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They're thirsty for those things. They're caught up on those things. And they're enslaved to those things. Now all these things are passing away. But the word of God, he who abides in the Lord will last forever, will abide forever. He who does the will of God, he who does things to please God, he who does things to, to live and abide in God will live forever. The fact, the matter is that we are saved. Another evidence that we are saved is that we seek after righteousness. We seek after righteousness. We want, and we want to do righteous works. We want to live a life of pleasing God. We have that desire. We have that heart. And that all came from God. 
And we have wisdom and knowledge to know what God is, who God is. God has given us the power to live that way. As in Philippians 2 verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You know, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches us and helps us to differentiate what is the will of God. It helps us. It helps us to understand. It helps us to give us, gives us the strength to please the Lord and live a life that is acceptable to Him, right? That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Not by force or compulsion, but live by God's desire, by our hope being aligned with God's hope. To live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and when the day we depart and we farewell, we say our last farewell to this world, we have nothing to regret of. As born again Christians, we seek that. We seek after being hungry and thirsty for the righteousness of God, which is to do more of things that pertain to God and that please God's eyes. Jesus Christ himself obeyed the word of God and his desire, only desire in life was to obey the word of God. He thirsted to obey the word of God. He wanted to follow the will of God <clears throat> for 40 days. The Lord himself, when he was fasting, what did he need the most at the time? He was so hungry, he was so thirsty, he was on the verge of physically dying. And yet, even when he was tempted by the devil, he said to the devil and responded and defended his faith by saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why is it that obeying the word of God more important than obtaining anything physical first? Because to obeying the word of God is the number one, is the most important priority of our life. And John chapter 4, verse 6 and below, this is the story of Jesus going through Samaria. And as he was on his journey to Samaria in the midday, middle of the day, he was hungry, thirsty, and very weary. And he goes by the well in Samaria. You know, in the daytime, it's not a time where women come out to draw water. They come out to draw water because in, in, in the cooler hours, in the early morning or late night. But all of a sudden, this one woman comes by to draw water in the middle of the scorching heat. This woman, why was she different than other women? Why didn't she come later during the cooler times? Why did she come in the scorching heat? She came when no one was there because she didn't want to be pointed out by other people. She was a woman who lived their lives in sin. She knows that. So she, because of our sin, she didn't want to deal with meeting people and being judged by other people. She knew that nobody was going to treat her well, deal with her. They would curse at her or maybe even be withdrawn away from her. So that's why she would come at a time when no one would bother her. And Jesus says to this woman, give me some water. It's true. Jesus was thirsty. He needed water. But the fact that when Jesus saw the Samaritan woman, she already knew who she, he already knew who she was. He knew that she had multiple husbands in the past. And she's still not satisfied. And she's living with the sixth person, sixth man, that once had another husband. And she's a very unclean woman, very sinful woman. And this woman, she lived her life in misery. You realize that the more people sin, the more miserable they become? That's true. Why do people sin? Because they don't have a spiritual satisfaction. They look for the things of the world to really entertain themselves. When Jesus saw this woman, he had a greater thirst than the thirst that he just had for water. His thirst is the thirst to seek God's righteousness, which is to save a sinner. Jesus' purpose was to come to this world to save sinners. And therefore, when he first when he saw sinners, he pitied them. He pitied them. 
knowing that she's always had worries. She was never satisfied. And she just wanted to avoid people because other people weren't so good when they treated her. She needed water. And she wanted that peace. And she would drink water and nothing would satisfy her. And when Jesus said, give me a drink, she responds to him by saying, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She had so many reasons why not to give Jesus water. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't we don't deal with each other. You're a man. I'm a woman. We don't deal with each other. She said, no, I'm not going to give you water, basically. You know, Jews looked at Samaritans to be like, like animals, like dogs. They didn't recognize them. Jesus knew that very well. Jesus knew that when he asked her to give him water, she was going to refuse. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He mentioned something about this gift of God. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, you don't know, do you not know that I'm a man? I'm a person who can give you God's gift. You don't know who, who I am. You give me no water, but I would give you water. I would give you living water. And this woman looks at Jesus' response and is astonished, thinking, what is this man saying? He doesn't look like someone who would fool around or who would um, joke about these matters. And then she questions Jesus. Jesus says, uh, she says to Jesus, where would you find this water? The well is deep. You can't, you don't have any materials. You don't have any buckets to draw water. Where are you going to give me this living water that you're talking about? And Jesus says to this woman, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus Christ, he desired to give her everlasting water. He had the ability to do that. He, he had the ability to give them ever give this woman an everlasting water no matter how sinful she was. And then the woman responds and says, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. She didn't want to come here to draw more water anymore. Give me this water. Where is this water that you're talking about? This woman still thinks it's water, physical water. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have well said, you have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you live, whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Meaning that you don't have a real husband that would satisfy you. Jesus knew that she was lying to him by saying that she doesn't have a husband when she really did, a man that she lived with. But Jesus recognized that lie and said, you are right. Because you don't have a husband that really satisfies you to call you your true husband. <clears throat> Jesus didn't say you you have Mr. Kong or Mr. Kim, Mr. Park or whatever, you know. If Jesus responded like that and told her about the true reality that she was in, she would have ran away in, in, in shame. And Jesus knew that you had five husbands in the past and you're living with the sixth man and you, even though I know that, what you said is true that you have no husband. For little kids, when you discipline them and you just get angry and you hit them, they cry. But when you make them laugh and you hit them at the same strength, kids laugh. It depends on the environment whether the kids are going to cry or laugh. Jesus is an expert. He knows how to basically put people in their place, but not put them down to the point where they would flee from Jesus. This woman must have been so shocked knowing, how did Jesus know my heart so well? How did he know my circumstance? I've never seen him before. And then she says, I perceive that you are a prophet, sir. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that Jesus, Jerusalem is a place where one might 
go to worship. She questions Jesus like this. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the only place that we can go worship. Which one's right? What's right? And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. For you worship what you do not know. For God is spirit and you shall worship in spirit and truth. And she is astonished again. Now she comes to terms, this is Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah. Jesus Christ, when the Messiah comes, he will give us an answer and he's given me an answer. She's so astonished that she didn't even give him water. The woman left her water pot, ran into the city and said to men, come and see the man who told me all these things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She said, isn't this the Christ? Right? I, I She's not even afraid of her sins anymore. She goes to the people that she wanted to avoid so much into the city and said, Come and see Jesus Christ. Could this be the Christ? He has told me of everything that I've done before in my past life. And many people followed the Samaritan woman right behind her. Up until this point, the disciples would buy food for Jesus in the village and bring it to Jesus. And they would say, Jesus, eat. And then Jesus said, the food, I have food to eat which you do not know. No, nobody fed Jesus. But really, what Jesus meant is that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There's food that you do not know that I have to eat. That food is to do the will of God who sent me. The will of the Father who sent me. Jesus, he was so weary. At the point where he was so thirsty and so hungry. Jesus was able to prioritize what's more important. Which was the life, saving the life of the Samaritan woman. And saving the lives of that this Samaritan woman would bring to Jesus Christ as a result of what Jesus did to her. Jesus is saying that these things is the food. The work of God is the food that will satisfy my hunger. To do the will of Him who sent me. That is my food. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness then? To hunger and thirst for righteousness is to do the will of our Lord. And in order to do the will of our Lord, that is what? To bring people to the gospel and the work of salvation taking place. That is doing the will of God. That is the food that satisfies Jesus Christ. For sinners to come to God is what God is pleased out of. Is, is what God is pleased of. That is what Jesus came to do. And it is exactly what he did. For 40 days, Jesus, when he was so hungry, the Lord's food was the Word of God. Doing the Word of God. Applying the Word of God. As born again Christians, Jesus Christ coming into our life has also fixed the problem of our hunger and thirst. When a person, a soul, is saved and the work of God is expanding that is our food Jesus Christ he had to bear the shame and the, the heart the pain of the cross and when he prayed what, what was his prayer on, the, on, on Gethsemane he prayed oh father if it is possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as I will but as you will Jesus is saying God I don't want to die on the cross it's painful but if it's your will then I'll do it and because it is your will it is also now my will he desired that no matter how, how shameful how painful his death would be he's saying if it is the will of God I'll do it So do the will of God. Doing the will of God 
is the food that Jesus had. That is our food as well. That is the heart that the Holy Spirit has given us as well. To hunger and thirst for righteousness. The people of the world. They seek after physical things. So therefore because of that they cannot hear hear the groanings of their spirit. But Christians. We do not follow after the desires of our flesh. We follow after the desire of doing the will of God. And that's why the things of the world is away from us. Because the power that we have and this, this hunger and food that we have coming from God is so much stronger than the lust and the desires of the world. We're able to defeat the things of the world. The desires of the world. For us Christians, we have something that the people of the world don't have. And that is the true hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Even if I were to lose everything in my life, Luther said the same, Martin Luther said the same thing. Even if he were to lose his family, his money, his materials to his enemies. Why does that matter? The only thing that truly pleased me eternally is the Lord. And nobody could take that away from me. Other things are accessories. If I live, if I die, it doesn't matter. Great. I live under the will of God. Whether I live or die, we do it for the Lord, for the will of God. That is what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. When the Lord is pleased from us and I'm able to fully execute the job, the task that the Lord has given us in order for me to participate and do the work of Christ for many more souls to be saved, by that, by just by doing that, I can lose everything else in this life and I'll be fine. I'm okay. That is the right mindset. That is how it should be. People who hunger and thirst for righteousness... What do they want more than anything than food and drinking at the moment? People who have never been hungry will never understand that. You know, some people say that being hungry, not being able to eat is the same feeling as if your parents were to die. I mean, it's on the same level. You would be just as sad. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33, Apostle Paul says, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that many may be saved. Apostle Paul didn't seek his own profit. He didn't seek his own benefit. He sought the benefit of other people just by the reason that he wanted more people to be saved. He gave his time, his materials, his own happiness. And even if if this required our life, it's okay for me to offer to God. Whether we live or die, we execute the will of God. That is our true, true hunger and thirst. Let's go to the book of Titus, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 14. Titus 2.14 Let's read together. Who gave himself for us that we might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. The Lord gave himself for us, to die for us, to redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, for zealous for his good works. The word of God has cleansed us of our sins so that we are able to now execute righteousness. Another purpose to why, to why the reason why Jesus saved us is to cleanse us. And by cleansing us, we can become a true people of God, now being able to do the great works of God. 
A true people for God is someone who could do good works for God. There are good works that people could do, moral things that people could do. Helping the poor, charity work. <clears throat> you know, there's people who sponsor other students who don't have enough money to go to school. Scholarships. You know, free medical service. There's good things that people can do for other people. But nothing tops this, which is to save someone who is bound for hell and deliver them into the kingdom of God. Not only deliver them to the kingdom of God, but make them the child of God. There's nothing better than that. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It tells us about how Jesus was anointed Nazareth, Jesus was anointed, and he did all the good works of the Lord, and he went around casting demons. He did the ministry of God. In the heart of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was there, so that the Holy Spirit dictated what the Lord was going to do, which was the good works. And likewise, as born again Christians, the Holy Spirit is also in us, and it dictates the good works we ought to do. Being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, we are people who focus import on eternal things, of good things. That's the reason why God saved us. You know, it's not that we try to live mediocre lives and we live our lives until the day we meet the Lord. That's not how it is. We live a good, zealous life to do good works for the Lord as a result because He saved us. Not just some mediocre um, life that we do when we have time. No. We live our lives for God zealously. That is our hope. John 12, verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. When a grain of wheat dies, is planted, it preaches the gospel. It requires our sacrifice, which is our death. Meaning like our sacrifice of Christians to preach the gospel is like the wheat dying and is how it shall reap fruit. God will reap fruit. How can we be lazy when it comes to doing these great works? Psalms 118 verse 17 says, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The purpose as to why we live and not die is to do the work of God. As reasons for born-again Christians is to, to live is to, to is to bring more people to God. Are we still alive so that we can do things that we wanted to do all our life? No. We live our lives because of the very reason why God left us here to really preach the gospel to as many of his people. To share this good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all sinners. To share the news that Jesus Christ died to save sinners and make people come to heaven, become the child of God. It requires our sacrifice on our level as well. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, so great a salvation? This salvation that we have received is so great and tremendous. And likewise, our salvation being so tremendously great, other people's salvation is just as important. The people of the world don't recognize that. And because they don't recognize that, they neglect it. They are judged by neglecting the great news of God. Can we partake in that? We know that we as born-again Christians, our spirits are important and so precious. That's true, but just as your spirit is precious, other people's spirits are precious too. There is no greater work than to bring someone to Christ and to save them. That is what it means. To seek righteousness. To preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to people who are dying. That is our earnest heart. That is as if a hungry person seeks after something to eat or drink. You know, Acts chapter 4, verse 24 says, We cannot tell or speak of the things which you have seen and heard. We cannot but speak of the things which you've seen and heard. It's like 
A, a lion, when he finds food, prey, he charges at the prey. We must charge at people who we target to save we to, we, we, until they get saved. Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. As born-again Christians, we have to seek first. That is the number one priority as Christians. Making money, being rich, living a luxurious, luxurious life, that is not our priority. It's not right before the eyes of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What that means is the more people that get saved through the gospel is how God's kingdom expands. You know, when the time is filled that the Lord's kings expanded, He will come and He will return. The more we can convert people that were under the authority of the devil to the authority of God as it should be, that's how we expand the kingdom. And internally as a church, we love one another as born in Christians among brothers and sisters. And we do more of the ministry of God, expand the kingdom of God that way. And share this love to other people. That must be the number one priority of our lives. What do you think about that? How do you live your life right now? Is our hearts really seeking after the kingdom of God and His righteousness above all things? Then, all these things shall be added to you. Then. If we seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first, then the order is after that are things that we need for the flesh will be added to you. You know, God fills the person's stomach who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God is the one that fills it. There's a reason why. God will give us all things. But when we first seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first, even the physical things, the things that we need with our lives will also be filled. We don't live based on our own merits. We don't live based on our own talents. We live because God sufficiently provides for us as we do the work of the Lord. When I do the work of the Lord, the Lord will be responsible for all aspects of my life. That is the promise of God. That is the covenant of God and God keeps all His covenants. The reason why God's promises are not fulfilled in our lives is because we are not faithful to our end. Romans 8 verse 32 tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us, freely give us all things? If God was willing to give up his son Jesus Christ to save us, what is it that he will not give us? He will give us everything, even physical things. When you first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will give it to us. He will give us all of our needs. When Elijah... He preached the word of God. And he saw that help from man has stopped. That there was no more water in the creek. There was nothing for him to eat by the people. What happened was that the raven would, would deliver Elijah food and water as God ordered the raven to do. One way or another, God will take responsibility of your life. He will feed you. Psalms 37 verse 25 tells us the story of David. I have been young and now I'm old. This is his confession. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. The righteous man will be taken care of by God. That is the way of God. Proverbs 16 verse 8 tells us Better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues with justice, without justice. You can have a little. Better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues without justice. You could be wealthy and rich, but living your life without justice in the eyes of God. And that means nothing. It's better to be having little with righteousness in the eyes of God than to have all, out, all these things and not be recognized by God. Not to be forsaken by God. God will help us when we seek His kingdom first. And in the church, we can also, of course, help those who are weak, who are small, who are struggling.
in the church. There are those who are weak in spirit. There are also those who are weak in the flesh. Who are going through difficult times. Galatians 6 verse 10 tells us, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. We help other brothers and sisters. If they're struggling, if they're hungry, if there's an opportunity for us to do good, then we must take it. We must not lose that opportunity. To good works, to do good works. God will help us with the rest. Proverbs 19 verse 17 tells us He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord And he will pay back what he has given He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord And he, the Lord, will pay back what he has given You know As one who scatters yet increases more And as one who withholds more than is right But leads to poverty This means this there's one who scatters it, one who gives things, but increases more. Because he invests in God. God helps him with the increase. We must believe that. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous soul will be made rich, and whoever yet he who waters will also be watered himself. Whoever likes to give, whoever likes to gen be generous, to help other people. They, um, they themselves will be made rich. That is the promise of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18-19 through 19, Then let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, store up themselves good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. When you give, when you do good things for other people, this is that you may lay hold on of eternal life when you scatter when you give people things to help people that's investment to your eternal life in the eternal realm God will help you God will reward you accordingly assuredly I say to you in as much as you did one of these things one of these one of the least of these things to my brethren you did it to me he knows we don't live our lives for our own foolishness, for our own self. We're not people who would live our lives for the sake of our own benefit, but we do it for the sake of God. Those who seek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness is the people who are able to give to other people. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over will be put into your bosom for the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you. It says, when you give to those who need, you will be given the same back to you in good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over will be put into your bosom. We don't have much time. We are living in the end times until the very moment we have to be as those who seek God's righteousness, who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, we must give, do more sacrifice, do, do, and convert and bring more souls to God as someone who hungers and thirsts for the Lord's righteousness. And if you do so, God will help you with everything else, everything else in your life, all other aspects in your life, and reward you accordingly, and reward you here and also in heaven. Let's pray together. Our living Father, we thank you. As we were so far away from you and living our lives in sin, Lord, you have had pity for us. You have saved us. We ask that you may protect us as you saved us. For the rest of our lives, whether in our spirits or our flesh, we pray that we may conduct ourselves accordingly to your will. You, we learn today that those who hunger and thirst for your righteousness, they will be blessed. We pray that we may seek after your true blessings, your true righteousness, and that we may suffer that we may devote all our lives for your righteousness, Lord. And if it's required, help us to cast away ourselves and our lives for your glory to accomplish your works. We pray that our brothers and sisters who have been saved may all participate in this holy works that you have changed, that you have put before us. And that we may be someone who can carry out the works of righteousness. Someone 
who, who seeks, thirsts, and hungers for your righteousness, that we may all partake in your glory, that for the rest of our lives, your holy will would take place. And help us to live and devote ourselves and to be more faithful to you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who loved and saved us. Amen.